Take our reading this evening from the Gospel of St. John. Then Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you shall not have life in you. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath life everlasting, and I will raise him up on the last day, for my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood abideth in me and I in him. Many, therefore, of his disciples, hearing it, said, This saying is hard. Who can hear it? After this, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Will you also go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have known that thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus answered them, Have I not chosen you twelve? And one of you is a devil. Now he meant Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for the same was about to betray him, whereas he was one of the twelve. Words taken from St. John's Gospel. In his spiritual exercises, St. Ignatius of Loyola once wrote, Consider the three divine persons seated on the royal throne of the divine majesty. They behold the entire face and the extent of the earth, and they behold all nations in great blindness, dying and going down into hell. Now, for the sake of the meditation, he hears them saying, let us work the redemption of mankind. To stop man from continuing on the path of sin, from swearing and blaspheming. How is this to be done? We might continue the meditation in this way. The divine Son, the Word of God, piously pleads with the Father to send him so that the Word made man might first and foremost make restitution for the injustice of men committed against the infinite majesty and fatherhood of God. Maybe it would sound something like this. Send me, Father. I want to undo. I want to make satisfaction for all the injustice inflicted upon thee, my Father so that thy infinite mercy may flow abundantly upon the world, so that where I am, they too may come. And God the Father said, yes, sending his only begotten Son, and so the Word was made flesh in the virgin's womb and dwelt among us, filled with grace and truth and light making abundant satisfaction for all sin to please his Father, to make amends for all the wrongs done to his Father. So in a way, what's the first reason Christ came? To undo all that had been done wrong to his Father. That's piety. My Father has been hurt, and I'm going to undo it. Number one. Interesting. Vertical comes first. Then he comes to save us, horizontal. St. Peter Julian Amard indicates that a similar motive is behind the institution of the most blessed sacrament. This is what he says. It's a fascinating quote from this saint. The Eucharist is in excess of what was needed for the work of redemption. It was not required of Jesus Christ by his Father's justice. The Passion and Calvary were sufficient to reconcile us with God and reopen for us the doors of our Father's home. Why then did our Lord institute the Eucharist? He instituted it for himself, to satisfy himself, to content his heart. Understood in this light, the Eucharist is a most divine, tender, and loving thing. Goodness and overflowing tenderness are its character and nature. Even if it had been useless to us, the Eucharist was a need 
for our Lord. His heart would not allow anything less. Wow. Thank you, St. Peter Julian. God's tender heart could do nothing less. If he was to be true to himself, there must be a Eucharist. And he promised to provide the Blessed Sacrament even unto the end of the world. St. Matthew's Gospel. Behold, I am with you all days, even unto the consummation of the world. St. Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the chalice, you show the death of the Lord until He come. At the very end. What a majestic model of piety the Son of God gives to us. Godliness, when fully developed and operating, is not satisfied with minimal requirements. Piety, when fully embraced, will make our whole life one of service to God and to neighbor, leaving nothing for self-love. There it is. Nothing left for the fires of purgatory to latch onto, to burn. So even when this is accomplished, piety still is not satisfied, it seems, as the saints show. They always want to do something more. St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, Carmelite, Florentine Carmelite, her motto, famous motto, is to suffer and not to die. She would say that to God, to suffer and not to die. Wow, what a saint, huh? St. Teresa of Jesus wanted to suffer until the end of the world to save souls. And she saw a vision of what our times were like. And she was willing to suffer through these times even to save souls. Wow. That's amazing. St. Therese, the little flower, did not want to die because she realized there was no suffering in heaven by which to show love. No suffering by which to make amends for the sins of men. Where did they get this piety, such willingness to go the extra mile, such a pious desire to make amends for the wrongs committed against God? And the answer to this is important for making this mission effective in our lives. As St. Peter Julian Amard indicates, the answer is contained in the Eucharist, and it flows from it. The Eucharist is a most divine, tender, and loving thing, he said. Goodness and overflowing tenderness are its character and its nature. So, to build up our piety, to improve our godliness, to maintain our verticality, the most blessed sacrament is indispensable. By means of the Holy Mass and the Eucharist, it makes present to us all that godliness desires. A filial affection for God is renewed. The heavenly pastures are open to us through the Mass for grazing. We need to graze in there. Healing of body and soul, paying of debts, atonement for sins are made possible. Remember the ends of the Mass? Thanksgiving, praise, atonement, satisfaction, petition. The opportunity to be pleasing to God are made real. Very real. We would die of love or of fright if we saw what the Mass really was. If we only knew where we were, we would die on the spot. So beautiful is the Eucharist. When we examine the various historical groups and individuals that fell away from the Holy Catholic Church at some time or other, not surprisingly, they showed their impiety most, most of all, They showed their impiety how? By attacking the Holy Mass and everything associated with it. Almost without fail, it always, always lands on the Mass. Most notably the Eucharist, the altars, the priests. This makes the Eucharist a sort of dividing line that separates the sheep from the goats, the one true church from all other false religions. In philosophy and theology, we oftentimes learn about something we're interested in by looking at its opposite. So, if the impious attack the Eucharist the most, then the Eucharist must be the greatest source of piety available to us. 
Find the greatest source of impiety and look at its opposite and you'll find the greatest source of piety. It must be a dividing line where a difference is made possible and that's the Eucharist. Now consider some proofs of this profound reality. One of the Old Testament prefigurements of the Eucharist is the manna in the desert. If you recall, the Israelites, they complained all the time. They complained about all kinds of things in the desert. They were a stiff-necked and stubborn people. That is why they had to remain in the desert for 40 years. Although they complained a lot, they were nevertheless only severely punished one time for complaining. And that was when they complained about the manna. God was not pleased with this impiety. And so he sent fiery serpents to bite them. Here's the passage. And speaking against God and Moses, they said, Why didst thou bring us out of Egypt and to die in this wilderness? That was a repeated theme. They said that all the time. There's no bread, nor have we any waters. They said that all the time. Then they added on this one. Our soul now loatheth this very light food. We hate this manna. Oops, they crossed the line. Wherefore, the Lord sent among the people fiery serpents, which bit them and killed many of them. They crossed the line. As we heard from St. John's Gospel at the beginning of this conference, it was over the most blessed sacrament that many of his disciples turned away. Judas being revealed as a traitor for the first time over the Eucharist. Where did he get permission to go and betray the Lord after receiving Holy Communion? Go and do what you're going to do and do it quickly. We heard in the Gospel today, many therefore of his disciples hearing it said, this saying is hard. Who can hear it? Jesus answered them, have I not chosen you twelve and one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. On Easter Sunday, when the two doubting and depressed disciples fled the upper room to go to Emmaus, it was the Eucharist that changed everything for them. They had left the apostolic church. They had running away. They were complaining, depressed, dejected. And it says in the gospel, and it came to pass while he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and break and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And what did they do? They ran back to the apostolic church in the upper room. To the hierarchy God established. Historical events indicate that the Protestant revolution sprang from bad theology over the Eucharist. This is really interesting. There was a Benedictine monk named Baron Garius. He was the first to challenge the church's belief on how the bread and wine are changed into His Majesty's body and blood during the Mass. He lived around the year 1000. Not surprisingly, the church responded to the challenge such that this doctrine was made more and more clear. That's her custom. When it's attacked, she makes it more clear. The word transubstantiation was coined to capture this teaching. Yet, this doctrine was further challenged by a Franciscan friar named John Dunn Scotus of Scotland. Don't get me wrong, I like John Duns Scotus in some ways. He's the champion of the Immaculate Conception. He didn't get everything right. This friar had a difficult time understanding why the church would consider transubstantiation a better explanation than consubstantiation. So St. Thomas Aquinas got everything right on the Eucharist, and he got the Immaculate Conception wrong. Blessed John Duns Scotus got the Immaculate Conception right, and he got everything wrong on the Eucharist. Isn't that interesting? Well, this friar, he thought it should be consubstantiation. Fancy words. Transubstantiation means that the substance of the bread and the wine is completely transformed into the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All that remains is the accidentals, outward appearances of bread and wine. In other words, the Eucharist looks like bread, looks like wine, tastes like bread and wine, but it's not bread and wine, but the precious body and blood of His Majesty. As we know from many miracles, with consubstantiation, however, John Dunn Scotus and others with him held that the bread and the wine remained in place, 
but that God came and dwelt with, with, con means with, with the bread and wine. There are numerous problems with this theory, but the simplest answer is piety. Piety alone gives the answer. If the bread remained, that would require we genuflect to bread and to God at the Mass and in the tabernacle. This is not acceptable to piety. It would be against the first commandment. It would be a sin to genuflect to bread. And nor does it follow from sacred scriptures. So John Dunn Scotus went astray there, and he admitted it. He says, well, I don't know why the church is teaching this, therefore I'll go along with transubstantiation. But for me, I think consubstantiation is better. But I'll just abandon that and stick with transubstantiation because the church said so. Then he died. Although Don Dunn Scotus submitted himself to the official teaching of the church and accepted transubstantiation, as I just said, he had a following. And they weren't quite as faithful as he was. They were not submissive. One of them was another Franciscan named William of Ockham. He died in 1349. He followed the teachings of John Dunn Scotus, making his erroneous idea of consubstantiation more commonly known. This friar was excommunicated by the church for his unwillingness to bend, and I think he died in that excommunication. Over a century later, a certain man rose up named Martin Luther. He considered Occam his favorite philosopher and theologian. Not surprisingly, Luther held consubstantiation over transubstantiation. You get it? In other words, he did not believe in the Eucharist as the church does. No wonder he had no true piety. No wonder he revolted so easily and left the body of Christ. The man was living in error all along. Think about it. Protestantism has one of its major roots in a heresy revolving around the Eucharist. There's the dividing line again. Not surprisingly, from the very beginning, the Protestants have openly attacked the most blessed sacrament, the Holy Mass and the priesthood. Martin Luther himself called it the third bondage of Babylon. God forgive him. Babylonian captivity, the third bondage. From the mockery of the Protestants, we get these famous so-called magical words. Hulk es pocus. Hulk es pocus. Hulk est polk est. It's a mockery of the words of consecration in Latin. Hulk est enum corpus meum. They were saying, oh, you Catholics and your superstition, hocus pocus, hocus pocus, hocus pocus. That's where that came from. Protestant. In other words, those attacking the church knew this was a point upon which the opposition could easily unite. Again, again, again. Here is the dividing line between true piety and impiety. The attacks have not ceased. One huge billboard when I was going to school advertised a vampire movie. And these words, drink this blood and you will live forever. Sound familiar? Again, this is a parody of the words of His Majesty. He that drinketh my blood hath everlasting life and I'll raise him up on the last day and he shall live forever. Hmm. The third and most serious of the temptations of Christ, our Lord in the desert, was that he should bow down and worship Satan to gain the whole world. That's the third temptation of Christ. Clearly the devil, he wants to be worshipped, right? That's what he was saying. You bow down and worship me. Well, the devil wants to be worshipped and he wants to be worshipped like God. He's no dummy. Now how is God best worshipped? The Holy Mass. Through the Eucharist. Satan apes the Mass by having his own form of Mass offered. This is the so-called Black Mass, of which there's a variety. Anyway, the Black Mass is a sort of representation of the third temptation. Our Mass is the representation of Calvary. The Black Mass, that's a representation of the third temptation of Christ, a bowing down to Satan in order to gain the whole world. That's why they do it. What does this say about the Catholic Mass? We have the real thing, and the devil knows it. This fiend of hell... 
It's not making a parody of other religions' various rituals. He's not doing anything with Protestant services, Muslims, or Jews. No, he wants a black mass to fulfill and even represent the third temptation. Here, then, is the dividing line between good and evil, sheep and goats. What is needed for Satan's black mass to be most effective, most pleasing to him? Among other things, a consecrated host stolen from our altar or our tabernacles. Or even better, they need their own validly ordained priest. Sad to say, this has happened. And it's still happening. Such behavior incurs an automatic excommunication reserved to the Holy Father. It's called the graviora delicta, a most grave delect sin. Throwing away the consecrated species, canon law states, for a sacrilegious purpose, or taking them away or keeping them. That's a graviora delicta. No priest can forgive that. You've got a right to Rome. Now, why are the Satanists coming to our churches to steal our hosts? And there have been many tabernacles stolen in recent decades. I've been in the diocese where a tabernacle was stolen not that long ago. Why would they want one of our priests to sin in such a grave matter? Because they know it's the real thing. That's why. Recently read an article of a Satanic priest, he said, if you lined up 12 hosts on the altar or a, a table and one of them was consecrated, he would know which one it was. Satanists hate Christ so much, they know which one it is. It's the hatred that makes them find it. Isn't that interesting? That's how he phrased it. So, they know it's the real thing. They know our priests have the true sacramental power to consecrate and the devil and his followers... They're looking for these things to do their evil acts. The acts of the Satanists are among the most impious acts that can be committed. And thereby, it's a sort of reverse way, a sort of opposite way. It shows the Eucharist to be the source of the greatest piety available to us. This clearly indicates how much the Eucharist is a dividing line. Belief in the Eucharist is where faith is put most readily into action, making it possible for us to unite more surely with heavenly things and to turn away from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Listen to a desert father. He put it like this. When the Eucharist is received by a person, it burns out, as it were, by a kind of fire. The spirit that occupies his members and is trying to hide in them and flees. But the enemy will revile the one whom he is besieging all the more when he sees him cut off from the heavenly remedy, the heavenly medicine. And the more he thinks he is removed from the spiritual medicine, the more fearfully and frequently he will make trial of him. There it is. It's the Eucharist. Now, Lord supports these conclusions very well. As St. Peter Julian Amard recounts on August 21st, 1888, there were few cures that day. And towards evening, a terrible storm prevented the torchlight procession. And so, at the sight of the saddened, though not discouraged pilgrims, an inspiration from heaven suddenly dawned in the heart of a pious priest. Why not make a procession of the Eucharist among the sick? So that they might call upon our Lord as the people did of old, as he walked through the their towns in his mortal life. This plan was proposed and accepted. After all, the lady did ask that processions be made in that place. Why not Eucharistic processions? 1888. It took some years to figure this out. So the next day, which of course was the octave of the Assumption, now it's the Immaculate Heart of Mary, at four in the afternoon, his Eucharistic majesty was taken in grand procession out of the basilica among the faithful with tapers in hand. After benediction given at the grotto, the invocations began with much pious affection and heartfelt prayer. From all the pallets, from all the beds, from all the vehicles where human infirmity lay prone and suffering and dying, all renewing the gospel pleas of the blind man Bartimaeus, O oh Lord, if Thou wilt, Thou canst heal me. And behold, in front of the grotto, eight people rose up from their sick beds, immediately and instantly cured, completely healed. The tears flowed freely 
as the Magnificat was intoned. From that day, the cures taking place in front of the Blessed Sacrament through its procession rose steadily to account for more than one half of all the miraculous cures taking place at the grotto. Very often, the cures began in the waters and were completed at the procession, showing the intimate connection between the Blessed Lady's spring and her Divine Son's real presence in the host. Now, it's interesting that science, you know, rationalism, naturalism, had tried and tried and tried to prove the cures from the sacred spring from the water had something to do with that water itself. or something in there that makes it magical. Or how it was applied. Or maybe it was just psychological. But once again, rationalism and scientism were put to flight, drowned in that river. With His Majesty healing from the monstrance, the naturalistic humanistic ideas were sent back to the river from which they came. They couldn't account for that. It wasn't the water this time. Consider the cure of Nina Klin, a young woman of 22, was among the, those of the eight that were cured on August 22nd, 1888. A container containing 25 pints of sulfuric acid had spilled over her, causing deep and damaging burns. The nerves of the leg had been compressed in the scar, and for 10 months, she had been unable to move at all. Every known treatment was tried on Nina, but all in vain. Massage, electricity, medicines, and so on. They produced no results. Leaving the Paris hospitals, she joined the pilgrimage of Lourdes. Nina was twice immersed into the baths without a cure. But on August 22nd, 1888, she was lying on a mattress in front of the grotto when His Eucharistic Majesty passed beside her in this first of the processions. She was suddenly lifted up by a violent impulse and jumping from her bed, she broke through the litters that surrounded her and followed the procession with a short step. She was cured. Miracle! Miracle. In 1889, a year later, a young blind girl named Mary Louise Harrow, 19 years old, could no longer distinguish the day from the night. She too came to Lourdes. She had to be both led and fed by another. She had recurrent keratitis, inflammation of the cornea, and other deeply seated eye trouble, causing her eyes to lose all their clearness. Since she could not get near the grotto because of the large crowd, she waited by the baths some distance away, asking her friends to notify her the moment the Lord passed by. She's sort of like Zacchaeus, trying to find a way to be near him when he passed by. And as his majesty approached, the friends exclaimed to the poor blind girl, Here he comes, here he comes. Mary Louise dropped to her knees, crying out, Lord! If thou wilt, thou can cure me. Lord, make me see. Instantly, a blinding light crosses her line of vision. She feels a very acute pain and her eyes are open. She distinguishes the grotto, the kneeling crowd, and her Lord and King, Jesus Christ, in the monstrance, radiant with glory. Her sight is restored. Mary Louise can now see the finest, most delicate objects. The doctors examine her eyes. They are limpid and perfectly clear. Miracle! Instant miracle. The Eucharist made the difference. Interesting. These are indisputable divine miracles. There are several more like it, where just a tiny particle was placed on the tongue of a dying woman. She was so close to death, when she arrived at Lourdes, they showed her the cell to put her dead body in because they weren't convinced she was going to live more than a couple more hours. They dragged her to the grotto. The priest was coming by with communion. And, and he was resisting because she just like, she's not there. Put a little tiny particle on her tongue. Bang! She was up. Miracle! She was alive. These are indisputable divine miracles. Things the devil working out of that river can never do. Ever. They're well beyond his power. 
In the gospel, His majesty indicates that miracles are worked in proportion to our faith. To the centurion, He said, Go, and as thou hast believed, so be it done to thee. When faith is strong like that of the centurion, prayers are answered and miracles happen immediately, not gradually. To a leper, our Lord said, Be thou made clean, and forthwith his leprosy was cleansed. He changed water into wine in an instant to the marvel of everyone involved. He calmed the seas instantly. We also find similar extraordinary wonders often in the lives of the saints, as well as the miracles they worked after their death instantaneous miracles that nobody can deny. Yet, where are these instantaneous miracles now? I wonder. There must not be many faithful and pious centurions among us. In fact, it seems clear to me that an inversion has hit us once again. And inversions, folks, as I've been trying to explain, always, always harm our piety. To godliness is acid. Godliness wants verticality, not inversions. Disorientations kill piety. The inversion or disorientation I have in mind is how now faith is being subjected to science in our time. Even in the area of miracles. Notice how the miracles of our Lord in the Gospel and those of Lourdes just mentioned of which there are many more, they're wonderful to read about, they were apparent to everybody. Everyone involved. They saw, they saw, they knew it. This is a miracle. No scientific instruments were needed. All could cry out, miracle, miracle. Everyone present saw, everyone realized immediately that something marvelous had happened with many having their faith and piety strengthened anew. Then, then, science takes its proper place in seeking to verify that no natural explanation is possible for what had happened. So they ran the person down to the Lord's Medical Bureau to make sure that everything was, as they said, cured. But with the inversion, the proposed miracle is not readily known. It's not really known until we all agree rationally, mentally, scientifically with some instrument, x-ray, MRI, CAT scan. This is not to say that some unusual healing has not taken place, but rather I'm making the claim that these sorts of healings have not traditionally been considered miracles. The sort that build up our piety. The sort that make us go, wow! Miracle. Nor has the church proposed them as miracles before this time. Can you see how they're different? Can't you see? Science in the traditional way always follows the miracle. Now, science is leading the way. And we have to use faith to say, okay, a miracle was done, I think. With the inversion, we have science telling us what is or is not a miracle ahead of time, making the miracles more of man's mind than of faith and obvious perceptions of the senses of all involved. Thus, not surprisingly, we're often told much later that a miracle happened to somebody. A miracle that no one witnessed. That something deep inside of somebody that no one really saw get cured. One miracle I heard of recently took 15 years before anybody could say, well, I guess a miracle was done after all. Instead of our senses, we're forced to rely on instruments and experts to tell us these things. It reminds me of the motto of the 1930s World's Fair held in Chicago, which says its motto was, science finds, industry applies, man conforms. Science finds, man conforms. Yes, that says it all. If science says it's a miracle, then we have to go along with it. That is where our faith is today, being told things by science and industry. Science is now leading the way. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I am certainly in favor of science and scientific instruments verifying that something has happened that cannot be explained. But we must realize four things. Number one, 
These same scientists and their so-called instruments have been wrong many, many times. And many people who've been sick can verify it. Many false surgeries have been done. Many bad surgeries have been done because the, the instrument was wrong. Second of all, these sorts of healings do not fuel the piety of the faithful. This is why the church, especially at Lourdes and the Lord's Medical Bureau, has not presented them to us as miraculous heretofore. Again, traditionally, when God works a miracle, it is to strengthen our faith. It's to increase our piety. It's usually done in a way that is plain for all to see, not just the experts. It's not just mental or rational, but clear to the senses of all involved. Number three, does not this new method go hand in glove with the modern denial of miracles in the gospel and the lives of the saints? Our scripture study classes, we've been told, oh, they, oh, those miracles, they were really gradual. They were evolutionary miracles. They took time. They weren't really those miracles that we read. They exaggerated. Those gospel writers, they're so into exaggeration. Does this not fit like hand in glove with modern evolutionary thinking then? Miracles really don't happen like that. They're not that fantastic after all. And now finally, number four, it also shows that the term miracle is being stretched to mean things not heretofore considered miraculous. Case in point, in the closing documents of the recent Synod on the Family, we are now being told, quote, conjugal love is one of the most beautiful of all miracles and the most common, end quote. Now, in a sense, it's a very touching statement, but conjugal love is part of how God made us. It's very natural. We're all here today. We're all the product of conjugal love. There's millions and billions of people on the earth. Miracles are not like that. They're wonders that are rare. And they're supernatural. This is natural. This is an abuse of language and does not help our godliness. It's bringing something that we've always considered supernatural to the natural level. It's hard to see how any of these rationalistic kind of miracles edify our piety. They do not. Rather, they make us look up to what? Not to God, but to science as being superior to faith and in an aversion that is repugnant to our godliness has taken place. Now, I'm going through all this not because I enjoy it, but because I'm trying to show you that your piety is under attack and to fight for your piety. It's good to read the miracles of Lourdes. I can tell you how refreshing it is to see these miracles and what they really look like. Wow! To be there, to watch these people receive a fragment of the host and to pop out of bed from being a skeleton. Now, to regain our footing and strengthen our faith, let us turn once again to the Eucharist, God's dividing line. There we will find at each and every Mass when the priest says the words of consecration, an instantaneous transformation takes place, causing our faith and our piety to be brought into operation. What was once bread becomes the body of Christ. What was once wine changes into the blood of Christ, at which point the windows open onto Calvary and into heaven. We are present on Calvary and in heaven. If we could see with the eyes of faith, we would yell out, Miracle! Wonder! Marvel! When a sinner, having fallen into the mire of mortal sin, is drawn to confession, he goes in all dark and loathsome to behold. But when he comes out again, having made a good confession, he's filled with life and light. This happens instantaneously. Again, if we could see, if we could see with the eyes of faith, we would say, miracle. Here then is where piety finds its most secure home in humble adoration before the most blessed sacraments in the tabernacle and the Holy Mass, a place where godliness is free to graze in the unlimited pastures of faith, where verticality is ever-present. 
A chance to see things with the eyes of God. A chance to give expression to our piety by ways of reverence and devotion and adoration and thanksgiving and praise. We can die to self-love, offering all on the paten. We can plead for the forgiveness of those who have injured us, praying especially for them at the consecration. So let us definitively flee from the flooding river of naturalism, rationalism, secularism, scientism, which with its impious and unedifying waters washing through all levels of our world today. All of which try to bring things of God down to man's level. Making our faith submit to science and natural reason. Instead, let us seek out the Holy Mass and the real presence of His Majesty in the Eucharist to restore and maintain our verticality, to give it a backbone of our spiritual life, an immobility to withstand the rising tide. And so, here are some things we must do as dutiful and pious Catholics to take full advantage of this precious gift of the Mass and the Eucharist. Number one, Know where you are and what is going on inside the church. As the scriptures say, terrible is this place. Terrible is this place. It's the house of God and the gate of heaven. The Holy Mass is the most wonderful thing possible in this life. It is, without exception, the best use of our faculties, of our body and our soul that can be found in all the earth. You will not find a better use of who you are and what you are than a going to the Holy Mass. Second, when entering the church, use the holy water to renew your baptismal vows, to shake off the demons. Genuflect on the right knee, not only when entering your pew, but also any time you cross the center line or come and go from the church. Right knee, if you can. Third, dress properly and modestly always, not allowing yourself to be a distraction to another. You know, the faithful come to the Holy Mass to worship the flesh of Christ. They didn't come to look at your flesh. What is more, the truly Catholic woman at prayer, especially at Mass, it's amazing. She's mysteriously a little mirror of the church. That's what the woman is. She's a little mirror of the church. Here's the mirror, blessed mother. But the women in the pews, they're also little mirrors. Thus, she's to reflect the church in some little way. Thus, she should wear the chapel veil to show this reality, to play her role piously as God has ordained, as indicated by the apostle St. Paul in multiple places as well as the decree set forth from the second pope of the church, St. Linus. When Blessed Francis Palau was frequently visited by the church as a beautiful young bride, she was always veiled. Always. Our Lady always comes veiled. Ladies are called to imitate this, to be little mirrors of the church. Number four. Do not let anything distract you during the Mass or detract from it. Some examples. This is very tempting. Don't go to the restroom during the Mass. It gives bad example to others. And once one goes, pretty soon everybody starts to go. Go beforehand or wait until after it's over. If this is a problem, refrain from drinking too much water ahead of time. Don't eat for at least an hour before Mass. By the way, this is why we used to have such a long fasting period. You start realizing... Maybe that was a good idea. People didn't have any reasons to go to the bathroom. Well, anyway, we should not eat for at least an hour before Mass, but piety would say go the extra mile and do what they used to do, at least three hours. Try your best. Number five, maintain the proper positions at prayer. I know, I struggle here too. Sit and kneel upright in church. Make your body pray with your soul. Remember, you're a body and a soul. With the position of your body, tell God you're praying with your body. Show Him. 
Do not cross your legs or allow anything slouchy whatsoever in your demeanor while in church at prayer. Parents, do not tolerate any horsing around among your children. The devils can be crafty at times at getting your children to be the center of attention or to distract people at Mass. Also, I find that people sometimes sit in places on purpose so they can view all who are coming and going. Shame on them. Do not join in that impious distraction. Do not purposely sit next to a confessional where you might hear something or see who's going in, unless you're forced to sit there, obviously. Avoid talking in church as much as possible. And also, don't read unimportant things at Mass, bulletins and brochures. Save those for later. Read pious things in a pious place. Never receive Holy Communion if you've had the misfortune to fall into mortal sin. No matter how embarrassing it may be to remain in the pews, go to confession first. If you can't, you know, it's not the end of the world. Stay in the pew. Do not go to Mass just to receive Holy Communion. Treating the Holy Sacrifice as if it were just a key to unlock the tabernacle door. There's not much grace in that. You receive grace and according to how you participate in the Mass, how devoted you are, the more pious you are, the more grace you get. If you are, as it were, just using the Mass to get communion, God's not happy with that. The amount of grace you're going to get is not going to be very much. Instead, when you come to Mass, plan ahead of time what you're going to do, what you're going to offer the Lord at the Mass, most especially at the offertory, as well as after the consecration. You have the power to act as a lawyer in the divine courtroom at every Mass, after the consecration. What are your cases who are you going to plead for with the precious blood in the divine courtroom? When receiving Holy Communion, do not chew our Lord like normal food. Let Him rest on your tongue until you're ready to swallow. Make a proper thanksgiving after Mass, not hurried, not worried about what all those others are doing and saying out there in those little groups. It's so tempting. Oh, I'm missing out. You're not missing anything. See about attending at least one extra Mass a week. Love finds a way. Piety is never satisfied with minimal observance. When we do these things, we fulfill our duties in a godly and pious manner. Faith increases. We become immovable rocks, making the river of doubt recede with the evil fiends forced to take flight. And healing begins. We maintain our verticality. We fall more and more in love with the church and its perfect mirror and neck, the Virgin of Virgins. Compunction rises such that nothing is too difficult for us, such that we will never be numbered among those disciples who go back to the world, who cross back over that line and walk no more with Him, or among those who stay inside without believing as Judas did. Instead, our Eucharistic piety will allow us to distinguish God's dividing line as it did for the first Pope, such that we too will exclaim, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have known that Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. Thank you for coming these five days. May God reward you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.